Welcome to the Media Navigators podcast brought to you by the World Media Group. My name is Belinda Barker and I'm the Chief Executive. Today we're going to be talking about first party data and specifically within the context of the oncoming cookie-less world. In this podcast, I'm very much going to take a back seat. We have two specialists joining us. And to be perfectly honest, I know half of the conversation is going to go um, above my head. So I'm I'm going to play the part of the audience and occasionally uh, put in questions when I feel that I'm, I'm not understanding everything that's happening. So the two people joining us today are um, Kedar Prabh, Prabhu, am I pronouncing that? Prabhu, perfect. Kedar is the VP of Ad Product and Technology at Dow Jones. So welcome to you, Kedar. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. Brilliant. And uh, talking with Kedar will be Victoria Cook, um, usually known as Vicky, uh, who's partner at Mindshare and head of Global Audiences. Hi, nice to be here as well. Good, good conversation is going to happen. Brilliant. Brilliant. So before we kind of get into the main part of the conversation, I really want to ask Kedar to, to explain um, really what it means, what, what you mean by a cookie-less world, what the implications are for marketeers and audience planners, and, and, and put a timeline on this. When, when is it going to happen? Um, is it already happening? Uh, when, when do we have to start getting worried about it? Uh, great questions. So let me start by explaining what we refer to when we say the cookie apocalypse. So this refers specifically to the coming loss of third-party cookies. And all of this started two years ago with moves by Apple Safari and Mozilla's Firefox browsers to severely restrict the use of third-party cookies. Earlier this year, Google's Chrome announced that they would follow suit. Why is this important? Without third-party cookies, the ecosystem will lose the primary tech mechanism used to track identity across the open web. For digital marketers, it means a loss of audience tracking, measurement, and attribution that are built on top of that identity. For digital publishers, it means a loss of third-party audiences commonly used for audience and behavioral targeting and a greater need for quality first-party data. In this new environment, ad tech providers will need to move entirely away from reliances on third-party audiences, and many will need to redesign their product and service offerings to operate and add value within these new, new constraints. So the implications are, are massive for all, everyone involved in audience planners from, from what you're saying, from, from um, the clients and also the ad, I mean, ad tech providers, you know, it, it's, that is such a mega mega industry um you know we're, we're all having to pivot but they must that must be a completely different world how uh, are there any kind of obvious winners or losers coming out of it oh that's a great question uh so we think that this change will uh yield a flight to quality and an increasing reliance on first party data So the change is likely to benefit the walled gardens, including Amazon, Facebook, and Google. We also expect this transition to benefit premium publishers because of the quality audiences they attract, especially those that have strong membership businesses, which then power their first-party data. Which Dow Dow Jones does, because you're not, I mean, publishing is is kind of what you're best known for, but you're also a kind of a subscription intelligence business as well, aren't you? That's correct. Yeah. Dow Jones, uh, Wall Street Journal's Barron's Group, as we like to call ourselves the marketplace, is really well positioned here. And not just because of our strong membership business, but also because there's a strong demand for trusted news, um, which has led to significant growth across all our platforms and we're reaching more paying subscribers than ever before. Okay, Vicky, I'm going to hand over to you because you're, you're an audience planner. Um, and so you've got your hands on all of this world. So um, I'm going to hand over to you because I know know you've got lots of, of interesting questions. No, thanks. I think what Kinara was really talking about there about the content and the drive to 
um, quality content and content is really where we're seeing this going. So actually, what what changes that makes is really maybe a shift away from how traditionally digital was thought and actually back towards a much more traditional way of content and contextual targeting and advertising. What do you think about that? Do we think that that's the shift well, as well? I think that's likely to happen uh, given that third-party audiences will no longer be viable on the open, open web. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, what we have today uh, is really the wild west of audience targeting. Uh, where you have zero transparency and often poor results. Unless a marketer is leveraging a uh, trusted, high-quality audience, they almost never know what they're buying on the open web. Um, so I think uh, cer certainly there is going to be a flight to quality, and I think that will definitely benefit brands like Wall Street Journal Parents Group. So, Vicky, are you kind of suggesting, you know, I'm, I'm showing my old age here, that, that um, we're going to some degree back to um, the old skills of audience planning um, of, of 10 years ago. Yeah, to some extent with some digital new and vibrant twists to that. So I think that historically, you know, as we've been discussing, the, the quality audiences that you could buy were pretty small and few and far between. And digital always had a slightly... Uh, over-invested idea of what accuracy really means, right? So a lot of the things that we are measuring on digital are often predicted or using statistics to understand exactly who might be doing what. And someone's true identity is not necessarily reflected even through cookies. Now, having said all that, doesn't mean it doesn't have a massive impact on the industry and the way we're thinking, because we're going to have to be change the way we've thought about digital in the past, not necessarily directly to how it was, back in the old days, but it definitely is going to have a flavor of really trying to understand audiences. And that's where I think the subscriptions and people who have a permanent idea of someone will become even more important in this world. Um, and how that tech is going to stack up against each other when they're all walled gardens is also interesting. Have you had any experience of that working with clients directly or with agencies directly in trying to integrate that idea of who that identity is and making sure that they're they're targeting the people that they're meant to be targeting. Yeah, certainly. So uh, in the online world of cookie matching, uh, that, that exists today, but that world is largely going to disappear because cookie matching won't really be a viable um, technical solution in a world without third-party cookies. Uh, replacing that will be offline matches and second-party data matches with, where publishers and wall gardens integrate directly with brand data. And I think that's an interesting world where you um, are focused on both uh, data security, data privacy, and uh, creating uh, audience matches and measurement using both deterministic and non-deterministic matches. Um, so I think there, that that world is going to evolve more quickly uh, in order to sort of replace what we use today uh, with cookie matching. Yeah, and I think what we're seeing with clients is really having that conversation about what is that first party data? How, how, how much did they actually know about the person behind their data sets? And what identity framework, not just in a digital standpoint, but from a human standpoint, does that mean? Because we were relying on the third party cookies to sort of explain who these people were. And we're going to lose that. We're going to lose the understanding or the even suggestion of this person's a for better, a dog lover, for better or worse. You know, we'll, we'll have really good information about how they're interacting with certain brands and we'll have really good information about how they're interacting on platforms. But we won't always know, like we didn't in the past, the sort of contextual understanding of who they are. And I think that's an area where content providers can often help us um, really navigate that world because they will know, right? So... I'm assuming you know, there are different parts of different people's websites and those who go to that, it is reflective of who that person is or at least what their interests are. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think uh, premium publishers are well positioned here because we not only have a sense of uh, who our audiences are, but also how they're consuming our content and nobody knows our content better than we do. So we, we're, we're investing in uh, developing better uh, contextual targeting tools. Uh, one example is uh, Thematic, which is our contextual targeting tool. And that's built on uh, Factiva, 
which is our pr- pr- proprietary uh, taxonomy that's driven by AI and editorial enhancement to provide better contextual targeting and better results for our clients. Yeah, and I think that's really important too because it will help both those clients who do have a wealth of first-party data, but actually those clients who don't. So when you think about different industries, different industries have different l- amounts of information about a person. So anything that agencies and media owners can help segment the people who are going to lose out the most, I think will be really helpful. Um, so certainly, I mean, the advice that you're able to give them, I'm sure using that platform can really help them be able to target more effectively. That's right. We've actually invested in uh, analytical tools to help uh, agencies and advertisers work with us, better understand how our audiences are uh, engaging with our content. So we actually just launched uh, Dow Jones Insight earlier this year, and that data is powered by our in-house customer data platform. It pulls data about our subscribers, like their industry, job title, company, and then it matches it to their on-site behaviors. All of that is used to create better media plans and bring that to the marketplace. I think the other part that we haven't necessarily touched on is actually the measurement of this. So I think there's lots of ways around doing the targeting. There's lots of ways of trying to understand that person. But with wall gardens and maybe um, premium content having more power over these situations, actually understanding who we've targeted, who we've actually reached, what the effect of that campaign is, will be will be pretty hard. How 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 are you going about helping, or how do you think the industry will go about helping us us and advertisers? really understand the effectiveness of their media spend? Uh, that, that's a great question, actually, because I think measurement and specifically attribution are going to be harder, um, ha- harder numbers to come by in a world in which, um, in which con- conversions are difficult to, to track. So uh, measuring things like brand lift and conversion based on your advertising spend is going to be challenging but there's, because there's no way to really tie together there's no good way to tie together uh, where your ads were seen and the actual conversion or, or outcome that you're hoping to measure. Uh, so there are a few things you can do. One is you can validate uh, which audiences have actually seen your advertising. Two, you can develop um, lead generation uh, capabilities that help you uh, directly tie one of your out- objectives and outcomes, which is a, a specific lead, to the adver- to the advertising that advertising dollars that you've uh, spent in the marketplace. Uh, I do think uh, anything beyond uh, first click attribution is going to be challenging. I, I think they're, they're going to have to be the industry is going to have to develop better ways, maybe statistically driven, to understand how ad dollars are impacting brand lift and even conversions. Have you ever, uh, this is an open question and it's an interesting one because we are thinking about how we may want to try and integrate more data sets together. But obviously the more data sets you integrate together, the fewer the people that are actually matched appropriately. One of the key things is like, how do we make sure the sales data from people like Nielsen or World Panel for those FMCG clients, you know, how do we make sure that spend is still reaching it is a, is a really important conversation. So when you're saying statistical matching, that's definitely going to happen but making sure that, that we're all comfortable with the robustness of that, I think is going to take a long time because attribution modeling was m- much more able to be very direct and you could see the flow and you could see that. So do you think we all are going to have to just be much more comfortable with stats and really, really understanding those techniques or how do we help people explain those things? It's, it's a really difficult question, um, but it's, uh... I, think st- I think statistics is going to become more important in this world because if you think about the old world in which uh, Nielsen polled people to find out what, what content they were watching, that was one of the few ways that we had to understand the addressability of TV advertising spend. Mm. And in uh, today's world where there is no single view of what a, uh, a, a reader or an internet user does across the open web, that may be one of the ways in which we do that. So econometric econom- e- data tied to their geolocation, for example, might be one of the things we have to get better at. Lazy matching or non-deterministic matching between two different data sets might be something we have to develop expertise in. Yeah, and I think as an industry, we've, um, we've not as has been focused on that as we used to be. You know, we used to be as an industry, when you go back to the old ways of all cross-media measurement, be really comfortable with that kind of statistical uh, matching 
and making sure those things work across. But at the moment, we were more focused on the deterministic stuff. So it's going to be it's going to be an interesting time, I think, for both measurement and planners in in this new world. I agree. I think it's going to be challenging on all all sides uh, for both publishers and on the marketing side. The uh, before we move on, I guess I've got two two small questions. One one is, uh, I think, for you, Vicky, in terms of of the scale of the data that you're, you you know how how much are you going to lose when Google goes cookieless in terms of the amount of data that you you no, normally work with? You know, is is it a small proportion? Is it half is it what, what's the scale of of change that we're looking at i mean a lot of that does depend on the advertisers and how reliant they were on the third-party cookies to begin with but for those that were it's massive it's a massive amount of money that's spent using these sorts of things and the information i'm able to then um use to plan will be very different by different platforms and will have to be very direct so it will complicate things because you're going to have to think about things much more in silo than we than we used to have to do that doesn't mean it's a bad thing it doesn't mean that it won't make us work harder and it doesn't make it make us make better decisions and potentially you know really focus our ideas on the places which the advertising is going to be seen and i'm not sure that that's a bad thing so yes we'll be losing data and it will be a huge new way of working but it could be a really exciting time to really think about what we're trying to do when we're targeting a person and what audience and identity really means to the human, not necessarily just the digital connections of identity. That's really interesting. And I've successfully forgotten what the second question was because I was listening so hard to, to, to what you were saying. Um, so uh, I think what, what would be interesting, you Kedar, you did start talking about what um, Dow Jones's own uh, P1 strategy is going forwards, but um, you know what? What are the the, the key elements that that you're looking to um, develop over the next kind of twelve eighteen months? Uh, great question. So uh, the approach we've taken at Dow Jones is to start with the basics uh, rather than uh, focusing on data as the, the sort of strategic driver, we're really starting with who we are and what we do and what differentiates us in the marketplace. So Dow Jones, for those who don't know, is a premium business-focused news publisher. We operate a number of consumer-facing news brands, including Wall Street Journal, Barron's, and MarketWatch. And we also offer a professional information business referred to as PIB that provides data products and news services to institutional clients. Our first-party data strategy is a direct consequence of, first, our engagement with our highly sought-after audiences on our consumer brands, and second, our deep and proprietary knowledge about our own content through Factiva, which not only organizes our content, but organizes all published news content from 30,000 different sources and 20-plus languages, including our own. Interesting. And Vicky, I've just remembered what my other, the previous question I was going to ask you was, um, uh, it, it was it was kind of around the who it was going to impact most because you you were talking about for your clients. I'm assuming the biggest impact is is kind of for the FMCG, the the, the, the those types of brands, less so maybe the high net worth type um, advertisers. Is that correct? I think it all depends on how much first party data they. Have. So even with FMCG, there are some that sell direct and so therefore have, you know, fantastic relationship with their consumers. So it is all dependent on the infrastructure that a client already has in place and the first party data strategy that they've been, they've been doing for some time. So it will affect all of us. It'll just affect some more than others. And having said that, lead generation is still massive. So just because you have a first party data set that has lots of information about the people who have been interacting with you, you still want new people in the bucket, right? You still want to fill that up and make sure that you're getting as many people as possible. So it will affect everyone, but it will affect people differently depending on what their first party data strategy was. So my 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 question was to you now is is the one I'm really I just asked Kedar was uh, about what your own 
our P1 strategy is for the kind of the next 12, 18 months. Um, you, you know, it, it's kind of weird because as an agency, you don't necessarily have access to as much P1 um, data. So how, how are you planning your way around that? Yeah, no, it's a great question because I think we're we're both Mindshare and we're Group M. And so between the between the two of us, we are definitely making sure we're having um, conversations about with each client about what that impact is. And I think one of the things that Mindshare has always done is sort of reinvent ourselves for every client because every client has their own way of working and their own approach to the strategy. And all we can do is try and advise and give expertise on what potentially might be the best solution for them and the best partners to work with based on what their immediate needs are. And then clearly we will be thinking as well about for planning, for audience planning, how to take advantage of what the different partners have and what we really truly mean by identity. Because identity, as I've sort of said before, is a word that has been used quite heavily by the digital community. And I think we just need, really need to think about when I'm talking to someone, who is at the end of the end of the line? And we usually say, who's behind the click? And actually that human behavior, I think will help us navigate a world where we don't have this third, third party cookies uh, to hand anymore, because it'll help us understand why someone has gone somewhere, not just that they've done it. Um, this year has been weird. <laughs> um, and it has developed um, at breakneck speed. Uh, I think you, Kedar, uh, were saying earlier that we actually still don't have a deadline as to when Google are going to withdraw. Um, uh, is it assumed that it will be during next year? Uh, it's actually difficult to predict what the Chrome team will wind up doing, um, primarily because they're trying to trying to design their their solution in a collaborative way with the rest of the industry, and therefore there's dependencies there that uh, that are out of the Google Chrome team's control, and so uh, that's part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that we know that there's regulatory action that's coming. Uh, and so some of it may be antitrust action against major tech companies. So how that all plays out in Google Chrome's roadmap is difficult mm -hmm. to predict. At Dow Jones and, and at uh, sort of other companies we've spoken to, we're all planning uh, to meet that deadline uh, or, or be, be prepared if that deadline should actually uh, come to fruition on schedule. Okay. So... Um Last but not least, if you could make one prediction for how things are going to change in the new year, whether it be P1 data or any other major Im impact on audience planning in the first part of next year, what would you what would you want to put your hat on? Can I ask that to you first, Vicky? Sure. So this year, I think from our perspective, has just been an acceleration of change, right? A lot of what we were seeing at the beginning of the year was things that we knew were going to play out at some point, but things have just accelerated the process. And what I'm talking about are things like e-commerce. And actually, a lot of clients' e-commerce strategies and what they're trying to take to market is what has been accelerated. So I think from our perspective, the conversations that we'll be having really early on next year is how to have that direct relationship more, um, more true with your current consumers and how to make sure you get, the, get to know people who may want to be interacting with your brand through your own platforms. And we've seen a real push for that. And I, and I suspect that's going to happen in greater speed. That's interesting. Interesting. And Kedar? Yeah, I would actually have to agree with Vicky. Uh, I think we, as an industry, were predicting a growth in digital media and growth in digital advertising even before COVID hit. The interesting thing about COVID is that it's accelerated um, online work and remote work. And as a consequence, people are just spending more time doing things online, less, less time doing things in person. So it's accelerated uh, digital commerce and online commerce. 
And we think that that's, uh, so there have been sort of, um, economic impacts that were deleterious to uh, digital advertising in the short term. But in the long term, it looks like it's only going to accelerate in the coming year. That's brilliant. Thank you both so much. Um, I think I lost uh, a little bit in the middle where you slightly got over the top of my head, but I do feel that I understand the subject better now. And, and I feel in pleased about the fact that this could in fact favor journalistic brands where where we've got you know the trust and 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 more of the first party data so I'm it's made me happy anyway um, so I'd really like to thank you both um, for spending this time um, explaining to me and hopefully to the audience listening um, so Kedar thank you very much for joining us thanks so much for having me and I uh, hope you join us again too. And thank you, Vicky, as well. No problem. It's been good. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.